I would like to, uh, to thank uh, Liv Orgad for uh, chairing the session. Um, Liv um, is, um, uh, has many, has many, um, many competencies and um, he is uh, working uh, on uh, various um, issues uh, at the interface of uh, technology, law, uh, politics, uh, He's uh, running uh, here at the UI a project on uh, global citizenship governance, a challenging uh, uh, project that uh, maybe will give some uh, breakthrough. Um, but without further ado, since uh, time is really, really late, I um, give the floor to Liv, who's going to chair this, uh, uh, this session. The plan is uh, for having uh, um, this session only in one hour uh, because uh, no, there are also kind of uh, administrative uh, uh, constraints and uh, so I would ask uh, the speakers uh, to try to stick uh, to the time and I rely on leave uh, for <laughs> you should. the management. Okay, thank you Giovanni uh, for this introduction uh, and thank you all. Uh, I apologize for uh, uh, not joining you yesterday. I just landed yesterday night. And let me uh, join for uh, thank you for organizing such an impressive and, and super interesting conference. Um, the good news is that we have one of the, I think, one most interesting sessions, uh, which is the impact of AI <laughs> on really the legal sector. The less exciting use is that we don't have much time to discuss it. We have maximum <laughs> 55 minutes. Uh, so I will change the rules a little bit, and I will, we will do three presentations. So everyone who has questions, just keep them to... Uh, uh, that we'll do a kind of a longer Q&A session uh, at the end. The first speaker is uh, Kate Klonik. She's a PhD candidate and a, fe and a fellow, a uh, fellow in residence at Yale uh, University Information Society Project. She graduated from Georgetown University Law Center, where she was also the uh, senior editor of the Georgetown Law Journal. Uh, before law school, Kate uh, worked in journalism and wrote uh, for various newspapers, among them the New York Times, in The Guardian. Her research include law and technology, intellectual property, freedom of expression, and tort law. And she has uh, saw, it's not written in the bio, but I saw that you have a forthcoming article at Harvard University, Harvard uh, law, law Review on uh, the new governance. So congratulations. Kate, the floor is yours. Um, I'm going to keep this really quick because um, I'm not used to, I'm used to kind of a much uh, very back and forth Q&A um, and I, and this is also um, a project that is just in its very uh, nascent stages and so I'd be really eager for some um, kind of comparative feedback on it, uh, not just from um, an American perspective, which is where I usually have, I only have the opportunity to present there, so I'm really grateful for this opportunity. Um, thank you for having me. Um, so. Uh, my paper is about, and my, my idea is kind of that I want to talk about today is about um, art um, artificial intelligence, AI, algorithms, and content moderation. And if you're not aware of what content moderation is or the terminology, well, it's now kind of a ubiquitous terminology. People are generally understand this, but when I started researching this, it was uh, very new and something I had to explain to everyone. Um, but it's the idea that everyday people um, post things like pictures, text, uh, videos onto platforms like Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, but not everything that they post stays up there. Uh, sites use complex procedures and rules um, that they have developed to govern what stays up and what comes down. And so, until very recently, and I'm talking like the last two weeks, I think, maybe the last month, um, there were two sets of rules governing, um, pub governing these types of um, this type of content takedown and moderation. I'm speaking specifically, I'll speak to Facebook generally because that's um, kind of the mo where there's the most public data. Well, there are public facing community standards and these were very vague. Uh, they were things like no inappropriate nudity, no inappropriate sexual content, no pornography. Um, but there were also another set of rules that was much more intricate for enforcement of how those, um, for enforcement of those standards. And that was kind of like literal things like we define nudity as female breasts, any type of like raised surface area that could be a nipple is to be taken down. 
any type of areola is to be taken down, except if there is a woman actively breastfeeding and the infant appears to be awake. It was literally that like type of level of, of detail. And because it's not a very pleasant thing to talk about and people don't really like to hear about this kind of level of detail, a lot of these things were kept secret and Facebook very much guarded them as, a, as um, and so did all of the other kind of sites that did this, YouTube and Twitter. Um, how they had developed these roles. And I, I argue in my paper that's coming out that they were developed in kind of um, a common law type manner. The standards are very much kind of like the passage of a law in the United States or something like that, where you would pass something in the legislature and then you have courts that interpret it. And those courts, it's a very recursive process as it's placed against new facts. Uh, you define what it is that you mean by nudity and sexual inappropriate content and what you want to make exceptions for, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so basically, uh, what it, what, how this all kind of relates to AI is it turns out that contrary to kind of, I think, popular knowledge or um, what most pe how most people think this works, and I still get calls from a reporter all the time, it's like, did the algorithm mess up in taking down this photo? Like, no, 99% of the photos that are flagged on Facebook <laughs> to be taken down as being violated of the policies are flagged by humans and are reviewed by humans. And there is only a very small amount of AI and algorithms that take, um, that, are, that are dealing with this right now. Um, and just uh, those Facebook moderators, those people are mostly outsourced workers. Some of them are actually directly employed by Facebook or Twitter or YouTube. And they're in the Philippines and in India and in Eastern Europe and in Ireland. Um, and a, a small percentage is done um, the small percentage of algorithm AI mostly happens at what I would call the, um, the pre-upload or the, the upload stage or like the pre-posting stage. So basically those are algorithms like content ID that checks um, a, basically as a pixel, to, these are mostly pixel to pixel um, kind of perfect enforcement mechanisms. Um, and there's things like content ID and photo DNA. Photo DNA is for child pornography. And there's a known universe that is constantly updated by the Center for Missing and Exploited Children that basically has um, created photo image, like pixel photo identification that in like, like half a millisecond can check every photo that's uploaded to Facebook as whether it's a known piece of child pornography. Um, known being the key term there because if it's not in that universe, then it's not known. Um, so after that, most content comes down by, you know, I see something on Margot's Facebook page and I think that it offends the rules of Facebook and I go through an entire kind of what they call flow of reporting it and bucket it and prioritize it and then it gets put into a queue and within 24 hours as Clara mentioned in her presentation there's a lot of um, rules around that to try to get these things reviewed quickly though content is uh, reviewed right now Facebook's policy is to keep content up until it is reviewed and then it comes down so it's uh, that's I mean that's kind of an important consideration um, uh, innocent until proven guilty um, and uh, but there is and there is now supposedly an appeal system, but the appeal system, which was just instituted and is something that I will be working with them on hopefully, is a, um, an appeal system that I think is actually just, uh, to put it, to more accurately describe it, is actually a second trial. It is not an, an appeal system by like a more sophisticated reviewer or a more sophisticated moderator or someone who knows the rules better, like an appellate judge might be or something like that. It is actually just gets stuck through, the piece of content gets stuck through the system again and they see if it gets a different result. Um, so what I want to talk today about today and what I would like kind of some feedback on from everyone here um, is that in the last four weeks, um, Mark Zuckerberg has promised to increase reliance on AI and increase AI's use in content moderation. And he's also said that he's going to increase the number of human moderators, going from around 5,000 to 20,000 human moderators, which is a huge uptick. Like if you even take all of those 5,000 people and make them managers, to manage those 20,000 people, assuming that any of them have the level of expertise to basically be able to manage that content and know what they're talking about. It's a, it's a, huge, it's a huge scalability problem. The other problem that you have, of course, is that AI sucks um, in the sense that it's not very good at actually photo recognition or putting things in context or understanding um, bad speech. And people do tons and tons and tons of machine learning on this and naked bodies still get like, 
people still have their beach photos, which are like shots of just a beach, flagged as being a naked body because skin looks like a beach. Um, and these are problems that happen over and over again. And it also makes it really hard to give us the result we want that we have built into these very intricate human rules that build in context, which are like valences for social norms of what we want to see and what we don't want to see and how that's constantly changing online. Some of the most powerful things that we see and some of the most impactful are actually things that Facebook makes exceptions to keeping up. So for example, the Philando Castile video in the United States was a video of a black man and his girlfriend um, in a car with their infant daughter and he was shot point blank by a police officer at a routine traffic stop and she Facebook live streamed the video of um, him dying. And it was an incredibly graphic video and it was against Facebook's policies and they nonetheless decided to keep it up because they thought that it was newsworthy. And had they not made that decision, we could, have, we could be in a very different world. Like, Obama, the DOJ, um, sorry, the Department of Justice, there were a number of investigations launched into it. Three days later, for better or for worse, there was a shooting of, in Dallas of police officers um, uh, in protest. Um, there was a lot of fallout from that video. And so these are kind of some of the democratic potentials of, of, uh, of these platforms. And some of the risks that I really think are huge is that if you rely too much on AI and unsophisticated moderators and scaling too quickly, that you're going to risk taking down too much content. So, to kind of just really briefly say what I think that AI could be good at is actually what related to kind of something that Clara said, um, which I was so excited to hear that you're working on this. Um, but there are other wonderful people um, in the States anyways working on, um, working on this as well. Britton Heller at the Anti-Defamation League is pioneering programs and work um, that use machine learning to recognize hate speech in context. And they've gotten these to about 85% accuracy, uh, which is not awesome, but it's better than like 50 or 60%, which it was a couple, just a couple of years ago. Um, and that's just text, right? That's not text. Um, that's not text or photo and photos. That's not text in conversation. That's just literally recognizing text, and that's still that hard, and we're still that far from having um, a reliance. So I guess what, when you're working on these kinds of, on these kinds of mechanisms and you're making these kinds of choices of when you're going to use humans and when you're going to use AI, I think that you're ultimately making decisions between whether to have something that doesn't work great um, and which harm is greater, the humans not working great or the AI not working great. And what are the harms? to over-censor or to have like a, like a proliferation of hate speech and a continued problem with deep fakes, a continued problem with a number of things that really I think are um, antithetical and like hurt um, free, speech, uh, free speech kind of ideals. Um, but for global transnational platforms that choose, um, they, everyone can like kind of choose to be on, the the way that the people that are making these policies, they're mostly American platforms, and they're mostly Americans making the policies, and they're increasingly influenced by nation states, and I kind of gave the preamble of like my, the triadic model that I kind of have of how this all plays out. Um, and I wanna kind of get back to this idea that we do not have accountability to Facebook directly to make sure that they do not put into practice AI that hurts our free speech norms, or hurts or, or that even reflects our hate speech norms, as Claire also pointed out. Um, and so the, I basically, I think that there's, some of that is embodied by the EU kind of comes into the position of kind of being a little bit more rigorous on, um, on taking down hate speech and holding um, the, the feet to the fire of these tech companies. But also for a person living in Japan or a person living in Canada or a person living in the US, I have no democratic accountability to the EU. Like I don't elect anyone here <laughs> and I don't have any say in anything. So it's not actually necessarily better for me that the EU is reflecting its values and has such a strangle, like stranglehold on tech companies than anyone else, right? Not that Americans having that stranglehold is good either. Like, I'm, I'm, but there's there's a new kind of conversation that needs to be had that really balances these interests, and um, that's where I'm really hoping that I can have conversations with some of you. Thank you, Kate. Uh, a lot for. 
lots for uh, food for thought on at least uh, three level design, implementation, and monitoring, but we'll talk about it uh, during the Q&A. Uh, our second speaker is uh, Camilla Mantelli. Uh, she's a lawyer practicing law too. Yeah. Uh, so she's a practicing lawyer working at uh, PwC as a special uh, project coordinator uh, within the office of uh, the general counsel. Camilla also funded and uh, developed uh, Legale Faccia, which is uh, one of the first online legal service providers in Italy, as well as other legal uh, uh, online platforms. She has been working on uh, the Center for Legal Informatics at Stanford University, and currently she is a mentor at the University of Insobria in, uh, here in Italy. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I have actually last second um, integrated my speech, I hope I have done, uh, as Katie was perfect in covering most of the um, topics that are on my <laughs> starting presentation. So, um, <laughs> no, no. Um, so, uh, actually, I don't want to fall short of arguments, and um, I'll see if I'm able. Okay, uh, this is what I wanted to tell you <laughs> until this morning. Um, I'll give you a super brief overview of uh, what I could acknowledge is going on uh, globally in um, innovation in the legal sector as I am super lucky to travel a lot uh, to conferences that are held worldwide and I could listen to amazing speeches and, and find out what great brains uh, come up to. So. Um, this slide uh, was prepared just a couple of months ago and uh, you will see, I will go over the, the new slides I've prepared. It's already old, as Katie said. There's just no way of um, keeping the pace with what's going on in uh, uh, legal tech uh, market so far. So, these are just reference figures that you shouldn't uh, consider as final as they, they could probably change tomorrow. Um, but for any of you who uh, work in uh, investment capital and um, know something about capital uh, funds and uh, investments in, uh, in startups, you can see that the absolute the um, figures per se are not impressive in uh, a, a world that is massively investing in startups. Um, the legal sector, this is my opinion and you please take it as it is, um, requires uh, extremely complex research and technical, uh, technically difficult work to put together a valuable um, product to deliver to the market. So the investment is um, good, is increasingly, is increasing steeply, but is still limited to a very small um, share of the overall um, venture capitals investments in startups. So uh, these are the figures and uh, yeah, this is the breakdown of what I just uh, showed you. Um, and now we come to Italy. Yeah, I decided to keep this, um, even if we're in a European context, because I, I am Italian and I, I want to remind myself and <laughs> everyone in, in the ecosystem how deeply down we are here and how left behind we are. These figures speak by themselves. You see, um, 
If we talk about startups, they have a special registry in Italy. There are seven out of um, 6,800 registered. This doesn't mean that there are seven legal tech startups in Italy. Probably many more founders have chosen a different um, company type from startup to set up the venture, but still, I think really these figures don't need any comment. Um, the average initial funding is um, in over 90% of cases lower than 100K euros. Um, I also went through the profiles um, as it is a micro ecosystem which I belong to. I briefly went through the profiles of, of startups, of founders of these companies and not even half of them have a legal background. So, um, the fields of um, practice of legal tech in Italy cover the same distribution as the global ones, so we don't uh, different, differentiate ourselves from the rest of the world in this. And, um, okay, so um, this is really, again, what Katie said, so I will be super quick on this. Um, they are extremely advanced research centers um, worldwide on legal tech, which, um, well, this, um, this is an initial uh, thing I should have said before. Um, by legal tech, I mean, so everything you see in, in my presentation uh, merges the providers of legal tools to <coughs> law firms and providers of legal services by new technologies. So the online legal services are merged in, uh, uh, in my presentation with legal tools that are um, aimed at serving legal firms. That I didn't make a differentiation because it would have been too long. Um, so what we have in Italy is <laughs> represented here by Giovanni, um, <laughs> not only. Um, Amedeo Santosuasu, who you met yesterday, I don't know if he's here today or so. No, I left, okay. Um, he's the founder of the first one, um, then Giovanni comes second, not in terms of <laughs> priority. Um, University of Turin, oh, I don't know if anyone, no? Yes, okay, <laughs> ciao. Um, has set up a spin-off company uh, working with legal tech tools and then the National Center for Research has created a still public but a different uh, department working on the automation of courts activities. Um, this is what happens uh, in terms of conferences that I uh, was lucky enough to, to attend all, so um, there are many, many, many more, but I, I chose to speak about these. Uh, Codex Future Law takes place every year in uh, the beginning of April, and I don't know if Kate was there this year, no? At Stanford yeah. Codex, yeah, okay. So, um, that is, in my opinion, the uh, paramount event to just, you know, get the pulse of what's going on generally and presentations are outstanding. I, every time I hear people speaking there, I realize how, how much there is to learn, also in terms of um, how we, we say things. Um, Legal Week in New York City is a more commercial event, uh, which starts from a fair of uh, legal tools providers, but um, includes a convention which has become 
uh, of a, a very high technical quality, so I suggest that as well, and that takes place uh, between the end of January and the beginning of February every year. Liga Geek Conference is in autumn in uh, um, London, and uh, I, I'm, I'm very proud to have been among the first attendees of the, the first um, um, come si dice? La, for, um, uh, primo, la prima volta che c'è stata. Okay, the, the first one. <laughs> and we were just in a small room and it, it was um, <coughs> it was cool, it was high fives and, and beers and, and fun, but uh, now it has become just impressive. It's been sponsored sponsored by the, the biggest tech companies and uh, it's um, hosted over a hundred speakers and uh, I think well above a thousand attendees last year and it's growing and th that is really meant to join people, to connect people who uh, act in this ecosystem. So it is a uh, less technical but extremely vital um, event uh, and we have our Liga Tech Forum in Italy uh, that um, takes place in Bologna. I, I attended the last uh, one only. It's, it's, um, it was founded, it, it was launched by a um, privacy uh, related legal services uh, provider and uh, I, I, think, I think it's interesting. I, I was happy to, to be there this year. Um, okay, this uh, is the part I could probably be very, very fast on. As you've heard, um, more details and technical speeches on this. So the, the two topics I, uh, from being, being a lawyer, so uh, having no, IT background uh, whatsoever. What I could grab from the, the massive amount of information I received at these events is that there are basically um, two areas of the law that are affected by research and development in artificial intelligence and these are smart contracts or computable contracts and um, most of the people sitting here could be better than me in explaining to you what this means. So um, I, I won't go through this. And the uh, e-discovery systems that have been um, deployed recently are the second limb of what, with, with my knowledge, I could, uh, I could detect as um, strictly AI-related research uh, programs. Okay, I had set out a few, uh, but uh, you have gone through these topics um, in better detail, so I, s okay. So I wanted to bring you to two um, topics that were shown at, <laughs> at Codex this last uh, year, this year, one is a breakdown of what um, I told you before, very, very quickly, uh, Katie introduced to, to the Codex directory of, of uh, legal tech companies. Um, this is what they took down shortly before the event to, um, explain to, to uh, who attended what's going on. Uh, so it is basically um, a breakdown of what I said before. And you, ca you can see that the figures I was speaking to you that I worked on a couple of months ago are already old because this is what they did in, uh, in Stanford one month ago, and already the figures are completely different. So um, it is really exploding as a market. Um, it, it, it's growing, it's growing fast. Um, what this uh, outlines tell us is that 
the document automation area is definitely the one who has the largest amount of companies active and who has received the highest fundraising uh, recently. What uh, comes second is marketplace, which requires, and this again is my opinion, but um, which requires a, a lower effort in um, legal and IT crossed research. It is, in my view, at, at a lower uh, complexity level than the rest of uh, the categories you see here. And then uh, the practice management, which could include any to any any way, any instrument, any mean to make the work of a law firm easier. And then the rest comes um, with, with a significant gap after. Um, okay, so d forget about 2018 because that's just, uh, it, it had just started when this was presented. So the um, two, year 2016 was definitely the winning year in um, investments in uh, startups, legal tech startups. No, okay. And the other thing I wanted to tell you about is this presentation that I, I found incredible. Okay, this is just a story that was told. Uh, forget about the names. Um, it just tells you how the story goes when a uh, law tech tool is offered to a law firm. Okay, so um, 100 lawyers receive a, an email saying, hey, there's this new legal tech tool you could use and they they are invited to attend the presentation showing them what's, uh, what it consists in. Um, half of them go and half don't because they don't even open the email or they, they do but they don't show up. So the presentation actually includes a very nice lunch and tasty desserts and um, it actually sees 25 lawyers still seated at, at the end of it. And these 25 then go back to their desk and half of them don't, don't remember what they heard Out of these 12.5 lawyers, 6.25 don't <coughs> consider using the tool they were presented. So um, this is just to give you a taste of what happens when the outcome of our efforts is actually offered to who could take benefit of it. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Camila. Our last speaker is uh, Giuseppe Vaciago. He's a legal scholar uh, whose research focuses on IT law, data protection, and uh, cyber crime. He has been a uh, consulted for a wide range of national and international uh, organization and companies. Currently he's teaching at the University of Milan from which uh, he also received his PhD degree. He's a professor at the University of in, on, in Sobria and he's also the co-founder of uh, the Center for uh, Tech and Law of Milan. He has been a visiting scholar and a visiting researcher at many universities including uh, Fordham Law School and Stanford Law School and he's the author of numerous publications on uh, data protection and, and cybercrime. So, Giuseppe, the floor is yours. Many thanks. Um, I, I don't show my presentation as, uh, I think, that for three uh, good reasons. The first one is that I would like to leave the floor to the, to the question, to Akunai. 
or the lunch, <laughs> alternately. And the second is that most of the information that I have to, to tell you is already, has been already told by, by Katie and Camilla, and I thanks for, for the wonderful presentation, both. Also, your presentation was perfect, but it was a little slightly different from the topic that we uh, covered today. Mm. And then the, the third one is that I think that these arguments, I would like to be a little bit disruptive, could be covered in more, no more than five minutes. Because uh, every time that we talk about this kind of issue of uh, uh, AI and legal sector, we always, uh, and forgive me if I'm not so diplomatic, but I want to be a really, have, a, have a really practical approach, we always mention convention, uh, conference, uh, and, uh, and some uh, an enormous number of uh, startups uh, that basically <clears throat> are not uh, really have an impact uh, on, the, on the legal sector in my view. There is an investment that in the US is absolutely important, uh, but I don't see the, the real benefit now. That this does not, does not mean that uh, we, we, it, it's, a, it's a, the wrong approach. We have to invest to find the solution, and obviously, the, the, the evolution, the natural evolution in our sector is the use of AI. But we are in a situation that is really difficult uh, to say that is a defining situation. So I don't think that we need more than these five minutes. And what I want to, to tell you that I, 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 burn, I, I, I was born in a, in, a, in a world where technology was between us, so we used the phone but the technology was between us. Now, I start my profession in a world where technology was about us, so I started to study IT law with some interesting case regarding privacy or data protection, and then I, have to, I was amazed by the NSA case, and then we have a lot of other cases where the, technology is, the study of technology is about us. So in a certain sense, I thought that the real problem is that we could say we have to have fear of the technology that could be uh, uh, that could uh, surveillance as uh, make, make surveillance about us, but now we are in a, in, a, in a world where technology is in us, and so we have uh, uh, robotics, we have AI, so we have to figure out this uh, new challenge, and uh, and the, in the legal sector, I think that it's difficult to see that uh, uh, we, we will have a solution in a, in a short time. So there are a lot of rhetorical questions like uh, uh, if uh, AI and automation uh, could uh, substitute uh, the legal roles uh, and uh, how can a robot uh, treat a client like a lawyer do? Treat a client, sorry, like a, client, a lawyer do? Obviously, I don't think that this is a point. I think that the legal profession uh, cannot be substituted by an AI. I was uh, absolutely worried when I see all these kind of projects uh, regarding the Council of Europe, uh, regarding the possibility to have uh, a judge that make decision, but for other reason, I don't want to cover this point, perhaps in the Q&A. Coming back to the, to, the, to the lawyer, I think that the human uh, uh, activity is absolutely important in, in our profession. And there is a research from McKinsey that says that 24% of the lawyer's activity can be potentially substituted by AI, only 23%. And also a research by Lexis, a study by LexisNexis that says that many clients believe that one of the most important and successful characteristics of a lawyer are that we have, a, we could say, an understanding of the situation that cannot be substituted by AI. So I think that now we have to discuss about what will be the future, and I would like to divide, if I, if I may, the, 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 these kind of legal startups in two categories. There is a, a legal startups that produce, uh, that you could say, AI for lawyer, that produce software that are for lawyer, and there are another legal startups that produce uh, AI for the client, and there is a big, big and huge difference between these two categories. Because when you talk about an instrument that could be used by the lawyer today, we, we talk about any kind of instrument, that, that, that tools that could be used by a lawyer, yes, it's something that is absolutely interesting because lawyers need to know how many documents they have, what there is in the document, and how the documents are used. 
well, to, to, to them. So basically, uh, AI tools can, as uh, Virginia explained very well, create these kind of patterns and create these kind of tools. I don't know when and how, but obviously there are these possibilities. But now we have a lot of other instruments that are AI for the client, and there is a, a huge difference. So it's an instrument, it's a software that, we could say, bypass the activity of the lawyer and create an instrument that could be used directly for, for the client. I, we have an, an example in Italy that is called Ubenda that Camilla knows very well, that is a, a startup that is not owned by lawyer, but is owned by, uh, we could say, engineering, that produce the possibility to, to create privacy, or privacy policy and other kind of terms and conditions automatically for for a website, but then there are other products that they sell directly to the client. And for me, Ubenda case, it's, it's an interesting case because I know a little bit well the, the story and they don't want the, 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 the idea, the approach of the lawyer. They, 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 think, they say that uh, they, they, it's, 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 it's really clear their, their um, um, activity and they say they, 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 they think that the lawyer can create only obstacle to their uh, develop of the business. Because obviously we say sometimes you have to respect the law, so sometimes you have to, you cannot uh, create a privacy policy for a website that is, uh, we can say, the same for every single website. I, I simplify the situation. And say, oh, you, you create too many difficulties. I think that from a computer scientist point of view, it's better to have our approach and sell this kind of problem that basically sometimes could be illegal. So I think that another principle that I want to put on, on the table is I think that now we are in a situation where we don't have a legal tech company. We have tech legal company. And I'm absolutely worried about this situation because basically the, 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 rea the reality is that this kind, this kind of company are not owned and managed by lawyer, are owned and managed by we could say uh, computer scientist, engineer, and, and informatics. So I, I, I think that this is a, a, a worrying scenario uh, because I, I admit, uh, and uh, it's true, that we complicate it always. Any, all, any simple situation, a lawyer can, could complicate any simple situation, and this is true. But at the same time, sometimes the law is complicated and the contest is complicated, so we cannot simplify and sell these kind of products that cannot solve the situation. For the GDPR, it's the same issue. There are a lot of legal tech that try to sell this magical product that give you the possibility to be comply with, with the GDPR, but it is not a solution because the GDPR is different from any sector, so you need to have a different approach. So, I think that this is the main concept of my five minutes that is already uh, ended. Um, we have to think about at the, this different paradigm or if we call them legal tech company, the legal sector should be absolutely in charge of this process. Cannot be, we could say, only we could say the client or sometimes bypassed by this kind of company because this is not the right approach and all these uh, numbers that we have seen are bas basically, obviously I cannot generalize, but basically are composed by companies that, that, don't, that don't have this kind of legal approach. I finish, thanks. Thank you, Giuseppe. So, we have about uh, 15 uh, to 20 minutes for uh, questions. So let's start uh, this section probably. Yes, please. I'll take one in here, one, two, uh, and then we'll go to, yeah. Um, a question primarily raised by Katie's keynote, um, but also the other legal tech speakers may answer. Uh, you ended with a recommendation that education systems have to be changed. Um, I would love to follow up as an academic, but I don't actually know what I should do. Since I don't know how the legal profession will change exactly, I don't know what I should teach my students now. So, of course, I can have one course on legal tech and explain whatever is, it has been presented here, but I think you have a much more profound uh, recommendation that the, the whole curriculum needs to be changed because the legal profession will change. But how to do that if we don't know exactly which legal tech applications will fly? Any ideas or suggestions? So 
Okay, very, very shortly. Mm, okay, I become, uh, let's say, I belong to an, an academic institution since I am PhD student, but uh, I am also part of an industrial company, which is CNH Industrial, um, which is a former Fiat group, I would say. And uh, there are a lot uh, of scenarios in which, uh, for example, regulation and ISO standard must be applied in order to develop and manufacture the machines. And uh, what I see is that there is a, a sort of gray zone between the engineering side and the legal side, which uh, does not communicate effectively, in my opinion. So my question, very sh to be very short, is uh, how to improve this kind of process inside, a, I would say, a, a large uh, manufacturing company or even in a small one? That's, that's my point. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to start and then, yeah, hand, hand over. So, so I, I, I won't pretend to know to have all, all the answers to your, your question, but I think I'm just one, one part of, of this piece, and I think it's another getting everybody's heads together, um, all the relevant parties. <coughs> On that front, um, I, I think so some departments in some universities, and that's not universally true, but just don't frequently talk to e each other. If, if there isn't interdisciplinary research going on, people can still stay in their silos. So on that front, I'm about to have a meeting with uh, the Department of Law at Liverpool and one of the legal partners who we work with to try and see if we can all come to um, at least start a conversation about what, what we think the legal education landscape should look like. I don't think it should be reactionary and that I don't think we should be teaching specific tools and specific packages. And that's what we always say when we're setting the curriculum in computer sciences. We want to teach our students the fundamental principles of how to think computationally, how to be able to program, not just let's teach this new language that's in vogue at the moment. So I, I think that has to be a part of it, not being too reactionary to, to too many tools. But I think there are, there are fundamental topics that, that that could be taught. So uh, we're in, in the computer science department at Liverpool. We're getting lots of requests for people to come and give an introduction to AI for people who have got no background in computing whatsoever. So there could be a, these are the fundamentals. It's that jargon issue again. Um, you know, what actually is, is machine learning? How is that different to um, other techniques? There could be fundamentals of data science in there as well, data analytics, how to interpret data, data science jobs galore at the moment for all our graduates. But I, I think it, it, it shouldn't just be the computer scientist dictating it in, in the same way about the legal, the legal tech, um, but it, it needs an interdisciplinary um, approach and, f and for all the stakeholders to, to try and get their heads together and, and, and look at how the jobs are changing. So for instance, the law firms I work with, they're, they're changing their recruitment, they're recruiting more people in, who've got a computing background, but they have to be able to speak to the lawyers in the company and know something about law as well. So putting that all in the mix would be a start. I leave also the floor to Camilla, and then there are other two questions, so I want to be really fast. Uh, I totally agree with Katie. I think that uh, basically the problem is that uh, uh, we need to know how uh, the, the language of the informatics. The problem is that uh, in, uh, in, the, in the law school uh, in Italy, we have uh, interesting courses, but uh, uh, are not we are not able to speak your language, and so this is the first issue. Then there is another issue uh, that is how can we make, uh, and perhaps is a, is a sort of answer for you, uh, because <clears throat> the main problem is that I think that, as I told you before, we need to be in charge of this process, but we don't have the instrument. We, uh, obviously, that uh, we need the informatics to uh, dev develop any kind of a a AI tool, but if we are not uh, speak the same language, if we don't know how uh, AI function, if we don't know basically how to make any kind of software program, and I don't think that is so difficult um, to have this kind of uh, uh, computer engineering basis, I think that uh, oh, we can start. But when we arrive at this point, I think, and this is something that I believe, and I also write a paper about that, that the first essential step in order to develop the legal, the legal profession is to transform where appropriate the legal service or any kind of legal problem, we could say, into an organized process. The problem is that we don't, we don't organize our uh, work in an organized process. And that that's, is, is, is a work that we need to do before 
arrive to the to the to the computer scientists because we we cannot explain basically how we work because we we don't think we don't have a method we can say in a really simple way so we need to have a, met a method and this is important to solve a legal issue and then uh, and then uh, especially on on practical situation obviously when we talk about uh, academic perspective yes i i agree it's we have a method but when we are in the in the in in the, in the practice, and, and you, you make a, a really concrete uh, question. I think that we need to have this method, and then we can uh, transform this method in a, an AI algorithm. But this is the, 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 the point that we, left, well, we lack. Thank you. Okay, I'll try to be um, really, really quick. Um, as I, I think both uh, topics could. Um, be linked. Um, I have a, the vision from the opposite uh, perspective, not because I don't agree with Giuseppe, I completely agree, but because my story is different. I started as a lawyer who for 100% personal reasons had to implement a um, remote uh, process of um, providing legal services. So I thought of what was needed because I had been working for over 15 years and I said, okay, what can be done for lesser money for the client one fourth of the time and be of the same quality? And I thought contracts, okay, perfect. So I put together a platform. I, I won't be long now because it's completely off topic, but just to give you the story. Uh, there was thought by a lawyer who was putting herself in the shoes of a client. And I, I set together that and clearly it was liked by clients who did uh, have the chance to get the same contract for maybe one twentieth of the fee. Uh, I'm, I'm being just uh, moderate here, and in two days, uh, but I had done it as a lawyer alone. And so it had massive workflow and scalability problems because I had done it from one point of view. So my, it was very, very little um, money, <laughs> profit-making, uh, because the effort that was involved in, in the task wa was incredible, and the time needed to, to okay. So um, I think that the perfect solution is that the project is put together, taking into consideration all requirements that are of three kinds, legal, technical and economical. So you should have, for example, contracts. Now everybody's working on smart contracts. In my, in my field, it's all smart contracts, computable contracts, so blockchain. Um, I, I went to Amsterdam and met these two guys. Um, I, I don't want to you know, advertise their job, but y you will hear about them. Um, they're amazing. One lawyer, one IT guy, and they hired the best, one of the big fours, to put together a deck, a business plan. They will nail it, because what they've done is the, the fusion of the three limbs that, in my view, are required. So this is just a very micro, tiny side of the story that uh, concerns contracts. I don't know anything about the rest, but th this, is, this is my view. Thank you. I will allow three more, Andrea, uh, Jan, and then Nikita. I have, uh, I have a quick, um, let's say, sorry. question to... Uh, Andrea, sorry, another Andrea. No, 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 no. it's me. I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> it was uh, to Giuseppe. Um, and uh, mainly to challenge a little bit his worrying about this um, let's say more client-oriented new legal tech. Uh, no, you, you were uh, worried about this. I mean, we are in phase of transition, and you seem to me be uh, worried by the possibility of having 
legal uh, technology that is used by clients more than by law firms. Um, and on one hand, I, my, my, my question is if, uh, why this is not uh, simply a sort of corporative uh, defense of the lawyers saying, because this is the, this is the technological evolution. So something that happens, for example, in health system, everyone uh, now before to go to the, go to the doctor goes to, on the internet to seeing symptoms and to have an idea. And I think that, well, lawyers, I mean, can be protected by the fact that you need a lawyer at the end, uh, at least for certain kind of, so on one hand this, on the other hand, uh, I think that probably market could be a good solution for this because you want to, do, to, to build your own uh, uh, privacy policy as that Ubenda is doing, let's see what's happened after, I mean, if, if, if it, is resistant to courts or to challenges, so we will see. So, it's perhaps over, overestimated this this worrying. <clears throat> Short answer: Obviously, we are a corporation. We are more than a corporation. We are a politi political party. Ryan, do you know how many lawyers we have in Italy? How many what? How many lawyers we have in Italy? Uh, I count at least thirty. Of <laughs> 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 we have three thousand. <laughs> We have 300,000, sorry. Um, so it's, it's a political party, basically. But apart, apart from joking, I, 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 I totally agree with you. I'm not so worried about the AI for client. I think that it's a natural evolution. But uh, as Camilla uh, explained, I think that the best uh, tech, uh, legal tech companies are composed by a strong component of legal uh, um, practi pr practitioner or lawyer. The problem is that now we have a lot of tech legal company that are not composed by a lawyer or they have, for example, two engineers and a really young uh, um, lawyer that has no any kind of experience and cannot give the real uh, solution. This is, this is my worry. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, my question is about, uh, or, or stems from, uh, the interesting presentation that we had just before coffee uh, where there was a discussion about the use of predictive algorithms uh, in the judicial context. And I think that there's a parallel question or maybe a question of juxtaposition when we ask the same question about the proper and permissible role of predictive algorithms um, in legal practice rather than in judicial decision making. And here I want to define legal practice in the broadest terms to include um, legal practical decisions that new governors make as platform, uh, uh, as platform decision makers. Um, and Kate, you spoke a little bit to this without talking in the language of prediction. So I'll start by asking the question to Kate, but then ask uh, our other two colleagues if they have any uh, particular thoughts on uh, whether the risks are different, whether we don't have to worry about it in the same way we do when judges make normative decisions, etc. Before answering, we have two last remaining questions. Nikita, yeah, please, and you will be the, the last one. I'm sorry? No, please. Um, so I have a couple of comments, but it relates to the discussion that took place about changes to legal education. Um, so just reflecting on my own experience studying law and then practicing with a law firm, I, I had a couple of um, maybe sort of contrarian points. One is to say that when you're studying, uh, the study of law isn't necessarily at a technical level, it's more conceptual for the most part, and the technical experience comes largely by doing, and in the UK we have a sort of vocational course in between, but the point is that you might not need to be teaching how to use AI tools in, a, in the kind of first law degree. Um, it's something that you would learn um, on the job. But then the second point, which potentially just demolishes the first one, is that, well, actually, the model of the firm is kind of potentially an, an like anachronism in the first place. So you know, it's not just about teaching lawyers how to use them, but just the public at large. You know, it's not a lawyer who needs to know how to use this, but the average citizen who's going to use these tools to get their own legal services. Thank you very much. I have a question to, to Kate. Um, somehow linking the two presentations you had, because I'm, I'm wondering if, if we agree that there is a problem with Facebook and other platforms managing speech in a way that is socially undesirable. Uh, in what, what, what channel would you say should we go to tackle it? Because 
linking it to your previous presentation, I think it's, it's interesting how we can frame the, the debate in, in two ways. Now we could either say, okay, we have the people, we have the government, so the private, the public, and then there are these companies which essentially are just managers of, of, of content, and so they are prone to regulation by the state. And so we could say, okay, the state should come and just basically tell them which things that they're doing are bad and should not happen. On the other hand, and that fi I find extremely interesting, when you cited Jack Balkin, we could say, no, not really. They're, they're no longer just managers of content. They're not like newspapers. There actually are sources of power that is in structure public. They set up their own rules. They execute these rules. They make decisions. They, they, they use type of force. And so in a way, it should be the people talking directly to them to tell them how to behave. Now, funnily enough, as you mentioned, there was a chance for people to do that, and people just don't care. And that made me think, since we're talking about you know, limitation of power constitution, as, as, as Andrea mentioned, if while talking about technology, we don't look to the future, but more to the past, and see how constitutionalism came about. I mean, we had these very nice ideas for a very long time, but in the end, it took some really, really angry people in France to get really angry and behead a few people burn a few buildings, and then it started working. So I'm definitely not saying, especially since this is streamed online, that anyone should go to Palo Alto and <laughs> set anyone's headquarters on fire. But I'm just wondering whether, wh whether it's possible to actually go through that channel unless there is this revolutionary moment when people just, just too fed up to stand there. Lenard? Thanks. I think we should definitely teach our students to use uh, <laughs> software in AI. <laughs> Sorry, just very funny, the bifurcated. Like. Press with oh. oh, I'm sorry, did I miss me? Let's do the following. Let's <laughs> concluding the, the questions, and then I will give okay. each of you the, uh, the floor questions. to answer. Sorry. I'm sorry if I got a bit confused. Um, yeah, so I think we should definitely teach our students to use softwares and AI, and it doesn't really matter which we pick because the types of knowledge and skills they, were, they will acquire doing this will be transportable to other technologies. Thank you. Uh, so now uh, let's do the last round of answers. Kate, we'll start with you. Yeah, I apologize that my topic got assigned to this panel, which seems like so out of place uh, for everything else. But anyways, I will talk about the, the I will answer the kind of Ian's question um, first and then um, talk about the second question. Um, just briefly, I think that um, I think that there is what is actually most interesting to me, just by way of empirically speaking, from what I've under, come to understand through qualitative interviews, is that a lot of the um, a lot of the predictive nature of AI that Facebook and social media is using is related to servicing of ads and servicing of ad behavior and marketing behavior. And so that is, um, and that is, you know, and that's actually in the United States anyways, and also kind of actually related to this education idea, oddly enough, is an interesting thing that you see now that um, psychologists, um, that one of the majority, like, uh, the majority employers of psychologists and cognitive psycho psychologists in the U.S. as professors who are finishing their PhD as business schools because they're employing them to do marketing research and to kind of take advantage of these types of things and be able to employ empirics on these types of scales. So I think that that's kind of an interesting, um, uh, uh, an interesting effect. Um, I don't. I, as I kind of had stated at the beginning um, of the presentation, I, I have a problem with predictive models because of obviously, um, I, I think that there are a lot of conflicts between expressed and implicit preferences. And I think that a lot of the implicit preferences that we might have and a lot of the things that AI has shown us and a lot of testing and kind of cognitive psychology research has shown is that people have like a lot of implicit bias in their decision making process. And if we're basically, we're just sourcing or machine learning off of behavior alone, that it will recreate those biases in our policy. And if we want to be better people and create a better world, we don't, we want to be, you know, we would like to maybe decide that we don't want to like employ kind of racist predictive algorithms or sexist predictive algorithms or ableist predictive algorithms. So these are the types of things that, um, so that's kind of, I guess, to that point. And the other, the other question that you asked is, um, I think that you were basically saying, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, that there is this tension with companies, and you were having a problem with basically, I think you emailed me about this off list, so the, the idea of kind of the force that these private companies are taking, and like, um, in under, and I think that that's actually a pretty controversial idea, at least in the US, um, that you kind of expressed, which is that, um, 
that these private companies are in some way beholden to us as public actors in the way that a nation state is. And that is kind of, I think, the, the main argument that I make in my paper and the main kind of movement forward on this is to show that they are in fact kind of, because they have moved into this realm of governing, like what is, what is might seem obvious to you, but I think to them and to a lot of other people, um, the incentive structure that's been put in place is one that allows these actors to self-regulate and allows them a, a market structure that allows them to be incentivized to create different types of platforms um, that do different things. And directly regulating them is not necessarily uh, the best way to get at that. To my point about direct accountability, I would just and the face, it not working at Facebook. I would also say that that's like maybe a different time. 200 million is a different number than 4 billion. I think that there is actually a huge amount, a huge like learning curve that has happened in awareness as shown by all of the, the giant, all of the AI pie and like, you know, everyone wanting a piece of it and all of the, the part, like AI tech and law parties. And I think that the Katie talked about, this has just exploded, it's just exploding. Every, and there's also a correlation to everyone uses these things. There's just a little, there is a lot, there's a lot more understanding um, of the basic principles and ideas that are at play now than there was even five years ago. And I think that, uh, I think that you might have more engagement if you tried these types of things again. Um, so. So, okay, yeah. thanks a lot. Camille, last word? Last word because lunch is waiting for us. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> to, no. Giuseppe? No, so uh, con thank you for all. Um, and now as uh, humans, humans have needs and uh, we'll thank them at lunch. So lunch time.